And well, I got two protein jugs now filled with insulin syringes and generic peptide vials. Um, yeah, and I think that's uh, pretty much time to draw the line and call it quits right there. Vigorous Steve here with part two of the site enhancement guide. And now we're going to do some actual site enhancements using performance enhancing drugs. Yes. Let's discuss the base compounds first. But before we do, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. With base compounds, I mean anabolic androgenic steroids, which are sustainable. So you can use them for a prolonged period of time without too much negative health ramifications. Again, building muscle tissue takes time. And if you want to improve a weaker body part and turn it strong with some side enhancements, right? You're going to be doing that for weeks or months in duration. And some of the practices which we'll discuss in this video might put a little bit of strain on your health. So at least the base compounds that you're going to run should be the most sustainable. So that'll be a testosterone base, for example, and prima ballon on top to facilitate more anabolism. Again, feel free to run a very high dose of testosterone using an aromatized inhibitor or using a combination of testosterone and prima ballon in a one-to-one -one ratio in which case you might not need an aromatized inhibitor or you might need to alter the ratio to favor more tests or less tests to get sufficient amounts of estradiol. Again, estradiol helps with collagen synthesis, helps to keep your lipids in range, uh, potentiates neuroprotection and cardiovascular health. So there's a lot of things, a lot of reasons why you need to keep your estradiol in range. Don't do this protocol on an androlone only cycle with Dianabol because Dianabol supplies methyl estradiol, which is not bioidentical and probably doesn't fulfill the same physiological functions as bioidentical estradiol does. Test Primo, perhaps Nandrolone as a therapeutic amount for joint lubrication, especially if you're going to be setting PRs left and right or try to improve a body part with a little bit of wishy-washy knees, tendons and ligaments, right? 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams Nandrolone, either NPP or Decadurabolin will get the job done. And if you're on a budget, well, they are probably not going to improve lagging body parts if you're really on a budget because this entire protocol <laughs> requires you to have very deep pockets. Still, if you are in a budget, maybe you can replace the Prima Ballin for Baldenone, but consider its um, tendency for anxiety or um, evidence that it uh, potentiates some kidney toxicity. I would not say that Baldenone is sustainable. Um, well, I know what you're going to say. I'm going to run that 50 milligrams per one milliliter equipoise organobol for some side enhancement. I'll leave that entirely up to you. Personally, I wouldn't do that. I would stick to test Primo and Nandrolone at effective dosages. Start low, build your way up so you have a dose to grow into. You don't need to start with a gram of test, gram of Primo and 200 milligrams of Nandrolone, for example. You can build those up as you go along. And feel free to look into turkesterone or ectisterone or a combination of both. I feel that the effective dose is approximately 300 milligrams per day. And you can do 150 milligrams in the morning or in the evening or 150 milligrams of both. And then dose that accordingly, right? So I don't notice an immediate effect if I dose 300 milligrams either turkesterone or ectisterone pre-workouts. But I do notice an increased amount of collagen synthesis, which is ultimately going to result into more muscle tissue, right? It's a little bit of an additional, doesn't mean it's required and essential for the site enhancement protocol, but the more collagen synthesis we're going to get, the more successful the outcome of this protocol is going to be. And keep in mind that orchestrone and ectisterone will sustain sexual binding globulin levels to a certain extent while you're using testosterone primo and nandrolone, which could help with the anabolic process by increasing cyclic adenosine monophosphate concentrations within skeletal muscle, resulting in an increased activation of the androgen receptor when it's bound with testosterone primo or nandrolone, right? It's a little bit of a complicated process. I'll make a separate video in the future when I'm done trialing turkesterone, ectisterone, and know how they compare to Anavar at a very low dose of five milligrams per day, right? Stay tuned for that. Should be done in about a week or two. Then you have your base peptides, the growth hormone, the insulin, the IGF-1, perhaps in a combination with a D-peptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor. Cetagliptin, for example, right? I discussed many of these practices already in my ideal dream cycle video. I'll link that at the end of this video. So long story short, dosages of growth hormone between two units up until 
I don't know, 12 units, right? How much you can tolerate, how much you can afford. An ideal ratio from what I've noticed is one IU of growth hormone per 250 milligrams of steroids that you take weekly. So if your total steroid intake is 2,000 milligrams per week, a 900 milligrams test, 900 milligrams Primo, and 200 milligrams Nandalon per week, for example, that gives you a budget of eight IU's growth hormone per day. Seems to work very well for myself, most of my clients, and everybody that I talked to in the past. This ratio works very, very well. Synergy for hyperplasia and um, right, muscle volumization and growth, ultimately. The insulin highly depends on your food intake, right? One IU per 20 grams of carbs, give or take. There's very complicated insulin protocols out there. You might want to look into a long-acting insulin in the form of Lantus and do, then do a post-workout administration of Umalog, or if you're very advanced, a pre-workout administration of Umalog. We're not going to go into dosages. I have an insulin ebook dedicated for that purpose. I would highly advise you to give that a purpose if you're serious about using insulin. IGF-1, three weeks on, one week off, followed by a week of metformin. Again, dosages are going to be all over the place and depending on the body part that you want to improve. You can do a body part dependent dosage. Let's say a whopping 1,000 micrograms of IGF-1 administered bilaterally. So that's 500 micrograms left and 500 micrograms right of the quad. And it may be a lower dose on tricep day, right? We're taking myself as an example. So a very high dose of IGF-1, take a day rest, and then immediate dose of IGF-1. And well, if, if I was, were to go really fanatical, I would do maybe three administrations per quad of IGF-1, one in the teardrop, one in the upper quadrant of the quad, and one in the lower quadrant. So I would split that 1,000 micrograms of IGF-1 out to have a little bit of a localized effect. That would be the first um, localized site enhancement I would be able to get. That is in the form of IGF-1 LR3. I've experimented with IGF-1 DES and pigelated MGF in the past. I did not get much of a result, but if you want, you could do an IGF-1 DES or pigelated MGF administration pre-workout, maybe 50 micrograms or 100 micrograms or one of the other or both. If you can afford that much IGF-1 or mechano growth factor, and then follow that with maybe 250 to 500 micrograms IGF-1 LR3 post-workout, which has a much longer active life and should sustain IGF-1 concentrations for 24 to 36 hours after the administration, allowing plenty of recovery for the duration that you're recovering from that single workout. So let's say you train every other day, you would have um, a pretty high dose of growth hormone pre-workout and perhaps post-workout as well or pre-bed maybe insulin on a day and IGF-1 on a day, concurrently using acetagliptin, a D-peptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor to bre prevent the breakdown of insulin and IGF-1 and keep serum concentrations as high as possible. Three weeks on, one week off, and in the week that you're off, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of metformin XR to improve insulin sensitivity, IGF-1 sensitivity for the following three weeks, at which this point, this base peptide cycle repeats. Very complicated, very cumbersome, a ton of injections, but we're not done. We're going to do a lot more injections for the purpose of site enhancement. Yes, you're going to feel like a pincushion at the end of this protocol, but hopefully, hopefully body parts will have turned strong. Pre-workout androgens, a million options to choose from. From my personal experience, the most effective methods are either going to be Anavar, Superdrol, Anadrol, halotestin, but I don't think that's very sustainable, and neither is superdrol. But if you limit it to maybe once per week, so let's say you do superdrol once per week, anadrol once per week, and maybe anavar to promote collagen synthesis in between those two dosages, then you should be able to have a sustainable protocol that you can run for a prolonged period of time to improve these lagging body parts. You can also consider 100 milligrams of testosterone suspension or maybe 50 milligrams trenbolone suspension, which will have to inject approximately 30 minutes up to one hour before the workouts. So let's say you're training quads, you would administer 100 milligrams testosterone suspension, but bilaterally, so that's 50 milligrams test suspension left and right. So at least the post-injection pain is uniform 
allowing to work that away with these tissue massage therapy a little bit later in the day. 50 milligrams on both sides, maybe in the upper quads where you get the most blood flow and the most activation around your hips. Again, it will be tight. So make sure you have a therapist on standby to get rid of that. You should notice a tremendous increase in exercise performance, especially if you take 25 milligrams Trinbolone suspension, pre-workout bilaterally, 50 milligrams total. But I would limit that also just to once or twice per week. Now, this doesn't matter. You get to triple dip. You take Anavar every day. You take Superdrol and then trend suspension one workout or test suspension and anadrol one workout. You're going to have to pick and choose. More is not better. There's only so many androgen receptors you have. There's only so much pre-workout androgens you can take to take your workout to the next level. Um, my personal preference would go out for maybe a rotation through all four, again, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of tremble on suspension, but man, those workouts that I had on trend suspension, the rest of the day was garbage, <laughs> but the workout was absolutely um, traumatizing, <laughs> I would say, for my muscle, not for my mental states, because the workout was certainly legendary. Really, there's nothing else like trend suspension. The post-injection pain is horrible. The mood changes are immediate. But again, if you can put that mood change to work in the gym, and the strength boost you get from that should be very noticeable, especially in the evening when the soreness is already kicking in. Then you finish the day off with deep tissue massage therapy, maybe a little bit of grass tone technique. You go to bed for 9 to 10 hours and you wake up feeling refreshed, ready for your rest day or your 50% workout day. Again, you're not focusing on the body parts which are already strong, like I mentioned in the previous video. You save all of your recovery and your energy for the body parts that you're trying to improve. One day on, one day off. So you maybe use trend suspension one time per week. Consider test suspension maybe once or twice per week since you're working out every other day, right? You only get to use these pre-workout androgens on the days that you're trying to improve these lagging body parts, being the 30 milligrams of Superdrol or 50 milligrams of Anadrol or 50 milligrams trend suspension or 100 milligrams test suspension. Pick and choose, don't double dip with the exception of running 10 to 20 milligrams of Anivar on the days that you're not using the other pre-workout androgens, yeah, whether that's uh, through intramuscular administration or sublingual uh, administration, perhaps with a little bit of uh, grapefruit juice to prevent the breakdown for a little bit of um, superdrol anadrol, which is going to pass your liver, because the naringin or naringin within the grapefruit act as a cytochrome P450A3 enzyme inhibitor preventing the breakdown of oral anabolic androgenic steroids that are passing through the liver. So that might be a thing to consider while following this protocol. Ideally, you would take the Superdrol, Anadrol, or Anavar sublingually, and then maybe wash that down a little bit with grapefruit juice so you get the highest bioavailability and ultimately the highest amount of androgen receptor binding, potentiating muscle growth. You would be able to use Anivar on the days that you're not training, maybe 10 milligrams in the morning and in the evening, 5 milligrams in the morning and in the evening, 10 to 20 milligrams Anivar per day. Again, that's a lot of orals that you're taking or supplementing uh, testosterone suspension or trend suspension on the days you're not taking orals. A lot of additional strain on the body. Keep in mind that test suspension aromatizes to estradiol quite severely, so you might still need an aromatized inhibitor, right? All these compounds have their own unique characteristics and own unique metabolic pathways and potentiate um, the accrual of new muscle tissue in slightly different fashions. Maybe an entry-level uh, person can use Anivar, and if you're a little bit more advanced, consider Superdrol or Anadrol. And if you're high level and you can deal with the post-injection pain, trend suspension, there's nothing else. And then there's the healing peptides, which there are many. They all have their unique benefits and characteristics. Ideally, you run them concurrently alongside of each other because by themselves, they might potentiate a 1%, 2% benefit in this overall site enhancement protocol. But combined, you will get noticeable results. This also means that you literally turn into a pincushion. Now you're administering growth hormone and IGF-1 at the muscle that you want to improve, perhaps pre and post workouts. And they have maybe two, three, five healing peptides that you're administering at later points during the day, maybe post-workouts, maybe before bed. It's highly cumbersome. And take it from me, if you don't have the foundation in place, what we discussed in part one, the training, 
keeping the energy available for your lagging body parts and maybe not trading the other body parts which are sufficiently developed your pre-workout supplementation protocol your nutrition your foundation cycle maybe your pre-workout androgens those will be significantly more effective by themselves already especially in combination and when you do all of that right and you add the healing peptides on top gains a plenty gains a plenty and i wish i was in a caloric surplus myself before I added in these healing peptides, because the protocols which I'm going to describe now in combination which I described previously, what I saw with some of my clients who did this, they turned a weaker body part into a stronger body part over the course of eight weeks, 12 weeks at maximum. Again, it's very expensive, highly cumbersome, a fuckload of injections, I'll say that myself, but it will work. I did improve my triceps, I did improve my teardrops on my quads, but again, because I was not in a caloric surplus and I was training 100% of the body parts because I wanted to train and train everything, my side enhancement protocol was not as effective as it should have been, again, because I didn't put everything in place. So even though my triceps did improve, especially this outer part and my teardrop, um, it could have been a lot bigger, obviously, if I just ate accordingly. The healing peptides, which I feel are beneficial. I tried many other ones, but I feel that these are beneficial. TB500, which is a segment of thymosin beta-4, which is a bioidentical hormone that your body produces itself, albeit that it gets less and less and less with age. TB500 lowers inflammation, promotes angiogenesis, the birth of new blood vessels, and also improves healing. I would consider a thousand micrograms TB500 injected intramuscularly within the muscle that you trained that day before bed so you do your workout somewhere in the morning or in the afternoon you have your igf1 and growth hormone around that time perhaps some pre-workout or post-workout insulin with insulin upon waking which is going to remain active for the entire duration of the day and then you administer tb500 every other day to reduce inflammation and promote healing within the body parts that you just trained Ideally, you do this administration bilaterally as well, 500 micrograms on the left and again 500 micrograms on the right before bed. And I would run TB500 for approximately six to eight weeks. Again, you don't want too much angiogenesis. You don't want to have that in place the entire duration. Once there's a sufficient amount of angiogenesis took place within the muscle that you're trying to improve, there should be an improved blood flow, especially if you do this while you're also doing deep tissue massage therapy. So you do your deep tissue massage therapy first, and then before bed, you administer TB500 in the body part that you just trained, right? Intermuscular injection, which will promote angiogenesis, improve blood flow, allow new nutrients to be delivered, especially if all the adhesions in the scar tissue are slowly being broken apart. So if you do that over the course of eight weeks, but you continue with the deep tissue massage therapy and just go deeper and deeper and deeper, until the muscle is completely pliable, uh, unless it's flexed, obviously, in which case it should be rock hard. Eight weeks in duration, because there's only so much angiogenesis you need. And during the time that you're using TB500, you guessed it, BBC157, which is a segment of body protection compound found within the intestinal tract. BBC157 also promotes angiogenesis, also lowers inflammation, albeit to a lower extent compared to TB500, which actually lowers inflammation systemically but bpc157 only lowers inflammation at the site of administration promotes angiogenesis but it's very beneficial in collagen deposition within connective tissue tendons joints and ligaments so you can look at it this way the bpc157 is mostly there for the connective tissue where the tb500 is there for the skeletal muscle and again in order to grow your skeletal muscle and improve that particular body parts you need your connective tissue to be strong as well because you're going to be increasing weight progressively. I mean, it's the whole purpose of progressive overload, resulting in more muscle mass. And for that, you need your tendons to be strong as well. So you run TB500 at 1,000 micrograms per day, split bilaterally before bed for eight weeks. And during this time, also eight weeks, you run maybe 1,000 micrograms of BPC-157. But this you can administer in the morning and in the evening because it doesn't have such a long active life. Its anti-inflammatory benefits are not that potent from a systemic perspective. 
So you would do 500 micrograms in the morning, maybe bilaterally. And if that's too cumbersome, you just administer that subcutaneous on one side and then before bed, subcutaneous again in the evening. Again, BPC-157 will permeate into the surrounding tissue. It doesn't have to be injected intramuscularly, and especially considering that it mostly helps with collagen deposition in the connective tissue, you might want to do that subcutaneously close to the connective tissue. Let's say here in the elbow, for example, it might be difficult to inject yourself. So get your significant other or part-time nurse to do that, whereas the TB-500 would go straight into the tricep to potentiate its effects in the muscle that you're trying to improve. There's a reasonably new peptide out there that I've been trialing for the last couple of weeks. I got it through my compounding pharmacy here in Thailand. It's called ARA290. The ARA abbreviation could stand for its original manufacturer, ARA Pharmaceuticals, but I've been using a compounding pharmacy's generic version. ARA290 is a non-hematopoietic variant of erythropoietin, EPO, without any effects on hematocrit or red blood cell counts. It purely acts to reduce inflammation or inflammatory cytokines, which happen as a response to stress, including post-exercise stress states. It's said to improve hemoglobin A1C and cholesterol concentrations, albeit that I can't really tell from my blood work. They're pretty much the same as they are before. ARA290 is said to be neuroprotective and stimulate wound repair. It also shows promise to modulate neuropathic pain associated with type 2 diabetes, albeit that I didn't notice any of these effects myself, certainly not to the extent that Cemax or Selenc act as analgesics. And when you take these compounds with an intranasal administration, certainly offer some pain relief, especially during a workout when you're taking sets to failure and beyond, which is obviously going to be required if you want to bring up weaker body parts. You need to train insane. Now, Cemax and Selenc will get back to a little bit later in this video, I did notice from ARA290 administrations, especially in combination with GHK Copper, which we'll also discuss after this, is that the mind-muscle connection improves. So after a couple of weeks of localized and bilateral administrations of ARA290 in the lateral head of my tricep right here and in the teardrop of my quad, I feel that the mind-muscle connection in that area and my ability to contract this particular part of the overall muscle has improved tremendously. So now I feel that when I train my triceps, before I would only feel this part. And now I'm feeling the entire tricep, including the outer part. And it was always an issue for me to contract that properly. So I feel that the ARA290 certainly helps with that. I would not necessarily see this as a peptide that will improve muscle growth directly, but it mostly improves nerve functioning. And there is some scientific evidence to support this because ARA290 has been shown to improve nerve fiber regrowth in the cornea of the eye or improve nerve regeneration in inflammatory multi-organ sarcoidosis, which is a very rare inflammatory disease. Again, these are particular medical settings that 99% of the people don't suffer from, but the nerve regeneration is there. So it might help with nerve regeneration at the site of administration if you're administering this in a body part that you're trying to improve. That's certainly what I noticed. My mind-muscle connection and ability to contract particular parts of body parts has improved quite substantially, allowing me to train harder, get a better pump, a better contraction, and ultimately resulting in more muscle mass. I've been taking two milligrams ARA290 administered bilaterally, so that's four milligrams per day total. On the day that I'm training this lagging body part, I administer this before bed, similar to the TB500 and half of the BPC157 dose, and then repeat this protocol the next day. So if I were to train triceps today, I would administer four milligrams ARA290 split out over two injections left and right, and spike my triceps again tomorrow night before bed. Then the day after I would train quads, for example, if I wanted to improve that body part, and I would do two days of ARA290 administrations in the teardrop. So this would improve nerve growth, nerve regeneration, allows me to contract the tricep and the teardrop in the quads significantly better. And I would run this protocol similar to TB500 and BPC157 for approximately eight weeks. Again, there's no long-term data on doing a protocol like this to improve lagging body parts, and I don't think there ever will. I mean, these compounds are only researched in particular medical conditions and medical settings. So for us, just from a safety perspective, how much angiogenesis and how much nerve regeneration do you want? 
I would limit it to eight weeks only. I'm coming up to the eight weeks mark now. And then stay tuned for maybe a follow-up video, video regarding ARA290 use just by itself um, to see how long it would take for this nerve regeneration and this increased mind muscle connection and contractile capacity to diminish. Will it stay indefinitely? I'm not sure. Will it stay for only two weeks after discontinuation? Again, I'm not sure because this is the first time I'm running it. And I don't think anybody has ever used this particular compound to improve lagging body parts. But I did. I noticed an improvement and maybe you will notice an improvement also. This comes after months, months of GHK copper use. So as a quick reminder for the people who are not familiar with GHK copper, it's a copper complex tripeptide consisting of glycyl, histidyl, and lysine. GHK copper is uh, naturally produced in the body. And again, similar to thymosin beta-4, levels diminish with age. It stimulates wound healing, lowers inflammation, improves collagen synthesis, and also promotes nerve regeneration. Now by itself, when I was taking GHK copper by itself at various dosages, I did not notice any significant change in my contractile capacity at the sites that was spiking particular body parts. But as soon as I added in the ARA290, which has also been shown to improve nerve regeneration in particular medical settings, that effect certainly was there. So again, a combination of ARA290 and GHK copper is warranted if you want to improve mind-muscle connection through nerve growth at the site of administration. And that will give you an increased mind-muscle connection, but I don't think that GHK copper by itself is potent enough to facilitate that particular effect. All of that aside, you might read somewhere on the internet that GHK copper or GHK by itself without the copper or palmitate GHK is very potent and super effective to improve skin texture or prevent hair loss or remove gray hairs. After six months of continuous use, I noticed none of that. So it's a little bit of a fair warning to you guys. I underwent all of this post-injection pain for you to know that GHK and any of its variants is not potent enough to mitigate hair loss, whether that's applied intramuscularly or subcutaneously or used dermally, right? Palmitate GHK is said to permeate the skin, allowing for collagen synthesis locally. I did not notice an effect on my skin texture that way or hair growth for that matter. And I still have a couple of gray hairs here and there, which after months of continuous use did not go away. Keep that in mind. Regarding side enhancement, it does work. Is it worth the post-injection pain? I think for 99% of you guys out there, probably not. The post-injection pain is brutal. It is a legendary. You build up a little bit of tolerance after months of exposure. So not after a couple of weeks. Don't expect the post-injection pain of GHK Copper just to go magically away. And now you get used to the shit. Unfortunately, the post-injection pain will stay. It just gets a little bit more tolerable over time. And maybe you just get numb and desensitized and you're like, yeah, well, okay, it's, it's going to happen. It's part of the process, but I'm enjoying this additional muscle tissue that is now slowly being uh, deposited through the use of all of these peptides and performance enhancing drugs in this very extensive and lengthy and costly protocol. If you can tolerate the post-injection pain, right? maybe you want to experiment with a little couple of subcutaneous administrations first, because they will potentiate post-injection pain as well, but at least they don't mess with your contractile capacity. Right? If you administer that the day before training a particular body part, which you obviously shouldn't be doing, you should administer GHK copper similarly to ARA290. On the day you trained a lagging body part, you administer five milligrams GHK copper bilaterally, so that's 10 milligrams total. I experimented with 20 milligrams. I experimented with 2.5 milligrams. And anything in between, I feel that five milligrams per injection site seems to facilitate a decent amount of collagen synthesis for the post injection pain that you're getting and keeping a little bit of inflammation in the area, which you need to mitigate with deep tissue massage therapy and Graston technique a couple days afterwards. So, it's a little bit complicated, again, because the inflammation is substantial and the, the pain. Um, like I mentioned in a previous video, you might have a little bit of um, cabbage leaf wraps on standby to reduce some of the post-injection pain. Again, I'll link it at the end of this video. It should be of note and beneficial if you're trying to suffer through this protocol. You do your workout in the morning with the, uh, the growth hormone, the insulin, the IGF-1 injections around that time. Then you wait 
a couple hours, you do your deep tissue massage therapy session to mitigate some of the inflammation and the adhesions in that muscle and body part that you're trying to improve. And then you administer all of your peptides before bed, one of them being GHK copper, right? Five milligrams bilaterally, 10 milligrams total, the day that you train that body part and day after, similar to ARA 290. So you rotate those injections depending on what you trained. I do feel that a combination of these four peptides is significantly better for the purpose of site enhancement than running any of them separately. I've been using GSK Copper the longest, but I feel that let's say you were to start a site enhancement protocol, you would run all of them concurrently for the first eight weeks, then discontinue TB500, BBC157, and ARA290, but continue with the GHK copper because that seems to be the most potent regarding collagen synthesis. And once the angiogenesis and the nerve regeneration has taken place, then you can contract the muscle and the nutrient delivery has been completely optimized. The GHK copper will continue with the collagen synthesis and deposition and help you develop that body part further. And then the last thing you can look into is mitigating some of the neuroinflammation and the post-exercise brain fog, which is inevitably going to occur when you're training many sets to failure when you're trying to improve these weaker body parts and are in decent caloric surplus and while taking all of these performance enhancing drugs at the same time might as well throw in another two or three on top right while we're at it look into five to ten milliliters cerebral lysine on the day you're training this lagging body part again it will improve sleep quality help with nerve regeneration you get a super physiological dose of brain-derived neurotropic factor, as well as glial cell line-derived neurotropic factor, nerve growth factor, and ciliary neurotropic factor. Those four neurotropic factors are contained within cerebral lysine derived from pig brains. Might not be exactly halal, so if you're a Muslim, you might want to do additional research if cerebral lysine is approved. In this scenario, I noticed a tremendous reduction in neuroinflammation. Personally, I didn't notice a nerve regeneration effect at the site of administration. So I've been spiking my triceps and my teardrops with approximately 2.5 to 5 milliliters cerebral lysine bilaterally. It's quite high voluminous injection. So I personally can't recommend it. I did not notice any nerve regeneration or improved mind-muscle connection and ability to contract these particular body parts to a much greater extent which I was trialing alongside of GHK Copper, which also promotes nerve regeneration. So I did not notice any localized effects from cerebral lysine administration. So I've been doing them in the glutes ever since then. When I switched from cerebral lysine to ARA290, that's when the increased contractile capacity and the mind-muscle connection really improved. Now still, it's very potent regarding its effects to mitigate uh, post-exercise brain fog and neuroinflammation. So I would at least Keep the cerebral lysine in 5 to 10 milliliters on the day that you're training uh, very extensively. You can also look into the nootropic peptide CEMAX, which is a fragment of adrenocorticotropic hormone or CELANC, a synthetic analog of the bioidentical hormone Tuftsin. These two also potentiate an increase of brain-derived neurotropic factor, but it's the amount that your brain is able to produce naturally, which is then stimulated by either CEMAX or CELANC similar to how a growth hormone secretagogue is able to secrete additional growth hormone from the pituitary, so does CEMAX and CELANC increase the secretion of brain-derived neurotropic factor within the brain. Right? These are all potent enough to mitigate post-exercise brain fog and neuroinflammation. I already made a separate video about CEMAX and CELANC, so I'll link that at the end of this video. Again, they won't optimize or improve these lagging body parts directly, but if you're training freaking hard and you want to make sure that you have the best possible workouts and sufficient cognition afterwards, have a look into Cerebral License, Samax or Salank. I can highly recommend them. And I think this pretty much covers it regarding spiking and improving particular body parts with side enhancement. There's a lot more to be said, honestly. But I think with additional research, you should be able to uh, formulate your own protocol. Again, you don't have to do everything that I discussed in this video and the previous video all at the same time, all concurrently. Um, you'll probably just get nauseous and feel a little bit funky and horrible and, and that you're doing all these administrations <laughs> throughout the day. The foundation still needs to be in place. Right? Long story short, you need to eat right, train hard, 
give yourself adequate rest, make sure that the performance enhancing drugs that you're using are of the highest quality. So if you have to spend a little bit more on a pharmaceutical grade or getting these peptides through a compounding pharmacy, I would suggest that you do. Um, because again, a side enhancement guide is for people with deep pockets and making sure you have access to the highest purity peptides and pharmacological aids is certainly going to contribute to a successful outcome of this protocol. I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice, always available through consultations. So if you're not exactly sure about how and what and if and what's up and down, left or right, regarding this protocol, write it all down, send me an email. I'll let you know how much time we would need to give you additional and personalized advice so you can gain another inch or two on your lagging body parts without overanalyzing the entire protocol. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Have a look at my new workout clips channel, link down below. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. Much appreciated, much love. Thank for all of your likes and your comments so we can grow this YouTube channel a little bit more. A front double bicep for you guys. Man, I wish I was in a caloric surplus so I can grow these cannons a little bit better over the last couple of months that I've been trialing all of these peptides. But well, for me, the immediate goal was to get lean, which I am now quite pleased with how lean I am. Although the cycle is coming to an end rather soon, maybe another month and then in March, I'll come off cycle. And well, I got two protein jugs now filled with insulin syringes and generic peptide vials. Um, yeah, and I think that's uh, pretty much time to draw the line and call it quits right there. So it is what it is, but thank you guys so much for watching anyway. I'll see you guys in the next video.